Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church again. So we have been on this uh, series in Judges now for, this is the third week. And when we began, uh, we saw something very interesting there because the Bible says that the Israelites, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Remember that? And so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Very long time. That word, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know, it just struck me afresh this week as I was thinking about it. It's like, make no mistake, the Lord sees what we do. They did evil in his eyes. Reminded me of that song, and I know many of you know it. You used to sing it to It says, God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us. You know that song? From a distance. The only thing I would change about that song is that phrase, from a distance. Because I feel it's very misleading. You're like, God is watching us from a distance. So you feel nothing. You're like, hey, let me continue to do what I was doing. No. God can see what you're doing in secret what you're doing privately, what you're doing behind closed doors, what you're doing under the table, what you're doing chinia maji, just whatever. God can see it. And we said that God does confront sin. It's a God of justice. And we said, make no mistake, there is no such thing as sinning cheaply. That's what we learned in this story. We said on the other side, our God is our a God of mercy and a God of grace. And we saw that from verse 2 to 5, God was doing something to save them. Even though they hadn't turned back to him, he initiates this salvation plan himself. He said, behold our God. Behold our God. And he raises up a young boy who's supposed to lead a holy life and we are told there in verse 5 that he will begin to deliver Israel from their enemies. He will begin. And I'm so glad that today we had an opportunity as we were observing the communion to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. Sort of feel like Jesus Christ was really the better Samson. Because we too had an enemy pressing us, sin and death because of our sin. But God sent us a child who led a holy life, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? And then in the end, he laid down his life, his body was broken, his blood was shed so that our sins can be forgiven. In him, both the justice of God and the mercy of God are seen. So that God is found uh, just in forgiving us because somebody has paid the price. Then after that, last week we looked at how to cult proof your home. And I gave you two of my first points and I said the first one was tell your significant other what you're learning. You remember that? And what was the second one? Trust, but verify. Okay? So today we want to continue uh, with that message. And so I have uh, four other points. So I don't know how you're going to number them. I don't know whether you start number one, number two, or number three, uh, four, and uh, so on. Uh, so for those of you who are new, just number one. Okay? But those of you who are here uh, last time, number four. Okay? But allow me to, to read from verse nine. Says God had Manoah. Okay, remember what happened earlier on, verse 8, is that Manoah had prayed to God and said, God, please send back that man of God to come and explain this story better. Okay, and he prayed. He says, God had Manoah, verse 9, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He is here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, 
What is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. Verse 16, the angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. In brackets, Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Close brackets. Verse 17, then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that we may honor you when your word comes true. Verse 18, he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. Verse 24, the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanedan, between Zora and Eshtaol, and this is the word of the Lord. How to cult proof your home, part two. Here's my first point, or point number three. There is nothing to add. God has already given us his word. It even rhymes, right? Can I say that again? There is nothing to add. God has already given us his word. Did you notice that Manoah did not get any new revelation from the angel of the Lord? Did you notice that? I mean, three times this message is sort of repeated. First time when the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife. Secondly, when Manoah's wife repeated this message to her husband. And third, that time, when the angel of the Lord came the second time to repeat the message, okay? Same, same thing, just very little differences here and there, but same, pretty much the same message. And I want us to learn two things from it. The first one I already mentioned last week. I said there is nothing wrong in asking God to provide clarity when the matter is not clear. Nothing new was said, but at least it was reinforced. Okay, there's nothing new, there's nothing wrong, sorry, in asking for clarity. But secondly, let us learn how to take seriously the word that God has already given unto us. Let us take seriously the commands and the instructions that the Lord has already delivered to us. Now, there are people who have an appetite for new revelation. And these people are susceptible to cults because cults are the ones that promise you new revelations you know, special revelation, extra biblical revelations, you know. Their leaders use the Bible because they got a new revelation. Hallelujah. They always about new revelations. You go to church every Sunday, you know, I have a word, a vision from the Lord. Nothing to do with the text. Be very suspicious. Be very suspicious of new revelations. As believers, let us trust that God has already spoken clearly in his word and he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness here. We usually say that the canon has been closed. There is no new revelation that is not contained in these covers. We have the inspired word of God in our hands. 
in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, this is what Apostle Paul would say. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training you in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, that's what God is using to equip God's people for work, so to, 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 to thoroughly equip you for every good work. He's using the scriptures. It's God-breathed. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The author would say, and the word of God is alive and active. This word is not dead. It's alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing uh, soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of hearts. This word is not dead. It's still relevant today. God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. It's not like as if this word has run out of, you know, we need now uh, version 2.0. Because this one now, it's, you know, ilipitu and awakati. No. In fact, C.H. Pajan, who is called the Prince of Preachers, used to like to say this. If it is new, it is not true. And if it is true, you can be sure it is not new. Can I say that again? If it is new, it is not true. And if it is true, you can be sure it is not, it is not new. And that's, so, that's why we want to tell you guys, go back to the word of God these ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. That's why we want you guys to go. Learn to live there. You don't have to look for a man of God on the side because you are seeking a new revelation. That's why in this church, we encourage you to be serious with your Bible study. Because that's all that is needed. And I know that some of you probably are saying, you know me, I don't even know how to correctly divide the word of truth. That's why we were making advertisements for things like Pathway here, so that you can get the tools and you can learn how to make use of this word of God. This is what the Lord is using to transform your lives, to build you up, to encourage you, to rebuild. Anything God wants to do is coming from his word. That's why Manoah was told, go back to the commands that you were given. You saw that? Nothing new was really said. And now, of course, I'm not saying that the word of God does not have fresh insights. That's not what I'm saying. Hear me correctly, okay? Every time I come to the word of God, I actually see something new myself. This word is alive. It speaks. In fact, after the first service, uh, one of you told me, you know, that was such a, I didn't even see those things about cults that came from that uh, chapter 13. I'm like, even I, I didn't, I didn't know they were there. I just went to the word of God as I was looking at it. These things were coming out. Because the word of God is always fresh inside. Every time you come to it, it never grows old. But I want to distinguish that from these new revelations that have got nothing to do with the scriptures. New revelations I don't know from where. Only the man of God has access to that revelation. Be very suspicious that. Amen? And here's my second point. The God of the man is more important than the man of God. Can I say that again? The God of the man is more important than the, than the man of God. I want you to see this verse 15. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. And he says there in brackets, Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. It appears to me as if Manoah was really starstruck by this man of God. This man of God had brought good news to him. I'm thinking he and his wife have probably been praying about this issue, okay? 
And so obviously he was, this was exciting. And he wanted to reciprocate, you know, by showing his gratitude and his hospitality to this man for the good things that he was saying to him. And so he proposed a young goat, also known as Nyamachoma, which we know many Kenyans could never resist. We know that the angel of the Lord said, mm-mm. By the way, that's one of the ways in which we know the angel of the Lord was not Kenyan, you know, because who, who refuses a young goat, right? And this is what the angel of the Lord responded instead. He said, if you're going to prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. I was like, wow. He was self-effacing. He didn't want to take credit. It's as if he was saying to Mano, Mano, I don't want you to connect your blessing to a man. I want you to connect it to the Lord. Because it says there in brackets, at this point, Manoah did not realize that this was the angel of the Lord. Manoah just thought he was dealing with another man. This was like, okay, since you don't get it, okay, you want to do this, just give it to the Lord. Okay? And I feel that is the problem with many people today. They connect their blessing to the man of God rather than the God of the man. I tell you, in a healthy church, the pastor will always point the people to the Lord rather than himself. He will say, the Lord, focus on him. So he is the source of all that is good to you, all your blessing. The Lord, he is the author and the finisher of your faith. Not so these unhealthy churches and cults. See, cults revolve around personalities. I think that's why they're called personality cults. Because the MOG, the man of God, is the be-all and end-all, the author and the finisher of their faith. And all the people gravitate towards him in reverent honor, and I'm putting honor here in quotes. They bow down to him and they shower him with their gifts or whatever it is that he will ask for because they connect their blessedness with him and his ministry. I mean, they even go as far as sweep roads. Friends, sweeping roads. I don't know anyone in the Bible who anyone swept roads for. And they create, you know, such a serious protocol team complete with, you know, armor bearers and uh, bodyguards in order to protect me, you know, and And some of these guys, you know, they call their man of God, this is our spiritual father, you know? And they tumbo us there on social media with, this is our spiritual father. Something which Christ said that we need to be very, we need to think twice about saying such things. You know, this is in Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. It's talking about the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees and the leaders of their time who like wearing those big robes and like these places of honor. And I was like, be very careful about those guys. Hypocrites. You know, calling them your father and so on. You have a father in heaven. And you know, these men of God are fine with this. In fact, they demand it. They demand it. Dave Breeze is an author who has written a book called Know the Marks of Cults. He actually calls it presumptuous messianic leadership as a mark of a cult that ever emphasizes on honoring the man of God. I'm putting honoring here in quotes because it's something else than honor. I call it worship. Presumptuous messianic leadership. And the angel of the Lord, knowing that Manoah just thought of him only as a fellow man, would not have him do any of these things to him. He says, okay, you just then offer your sacrifices to the Lord. Pointed him to the Lord. 
But you know that Manoah was really bent on honoring this man. So he changed his strategy. Verse 17. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, okay, so now that you're not going to take this goat, eh? <clears throat> what is your name? So that we may honor you when your word comes true. Verse 18, he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Have you ever met a more uncooperating man of God than this one? I mean, for crying out loud, the brother is asking you for your name. He probably wants to write a check to you. I mean, if you were there, what would you have done? You would have given him your three names, right? You know, Samuel, I think our Okay, Samuel with a U, not a W. Thank you very much. Some of you didn't know my, my third name, so like, oh, what, that's... You don't look like that name. Anyway, uh, I was thinking if Manoah was dealing with some of these men of God that we have in our country today, what would have happened to him? I mean, he opening up himself up for exploitation like this. It would have been your, your rush word properly, right? What you guys call character development. I mean, we would have been watching this stuff on View Sasa. Because presumptuous messianic leadership usually goes hand in hand many times with financial exploitation. It goes hand in hand with financial exploitation. And of course, here, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not teaching that you should not be giving your, your tithe and your offerings, or you should not be giving generously to church, or you should not be giving these pastor's gifts, okay? Because I was seeing them looking at me strangely. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I hope you understand me. I think what we are against is this unwarranted veneration that we see extended to this so-called men of God, and the superstition that goes along with it. You know, I want to sow into their ministry so that a sudden breakthrough can come into my life. Here's my point. Look past the man of God and let your focus be on the God of the man. Amen? Look past the man of God and let your focus be on the God of the man. And I'm hoping that none of you will ever idolize any of us. Never put us on a pedestal. I'm hoping that what you do instead is pray for us that we may remain faithful. Because as Paul would say, we are nothing but jars of clay. So that all the glory and honor can go to who? To God. Of course, I'm not here teaching that you shouldn't honor your pastors. I think what we are against is this false honor, which is really worship and idolatry. That these people take advantage of and abuse people with it. Amen? Because Manoah didn't quite get, we know the angel of the Lord was actually much more than a man. But because Manoah only thought of him as nothing more than a man, he would have none of this. He says, okay, you just focus on the Lord. Which brings me to my third point. There is a limit to our understanding. The limit to our understanding. In verse 18, it says this. Manoah asked the angel of the Lord of his name. What is your name? That I may honor you. This is what he said. He said, why do you ask my name? It is beyond, it is beyond understanding. In fact, I liked that song that we sang earlier in the special. You know, it was saying, you know, what, what words could we ever use? There are some things we cannot even explain. And this is the point, friends. We have limits when it comes to understanding God. We have limits. 
Fear any group that tells you they have figured God out 100%. Friends, that is a cult. If they know everything, be very afraid. Okay? That doesn't mean that we don't give ourselves to the study of God. That's not what I'm saying. You can be sure we are trying to understand God. We are searching the scriptures every day. We are trying to find out who God is. In fact, we are praying God increase our depth of understanding. But we know that as long as we live here on earth, that our finite minds will not be able to wrap itself around the infinite nature of God. Amen? Okay, rescued, finally. <laughs> I was like, when was I going to have you guys back? <laughs> Let me say my point again. Our finite minds, friends, will never fully wrap itself around the infinite. Remember that. So yes, we seek God, but we allow room for all wonder and mystery. And we understand that in this life, we'll never get to know it all. And you know what? That's okay. Hear what the psalmist says in Psalms 131, verse 1 and 2. He says this. He says, my heart is not proud. Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a wind child with its mother. Like a wind child, I am content. Wow. He says, I'm not proud. And I think only proud people want to imagine that they can figure everything all out. He says, I'm not proud. I'm not haughty. I don't concern myself with things that are too great for me. But I'm like a little child, wind child with its mother, I am content. Elsewhere, in Psalms 139, the psalmist, as he was thinking about just God and the things God knows, he would say this, verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Thinking about what God knows and all that there is to know about God's like, it's too lofty for me. Paul, he wrote such an amazing book called the Book of Romans. Have you ever read it? Completely blows you away. Oh, amazing stuff. But in chapter 11, Paul just breaks into worship as he's thinking about God and the things that he's revealing. He says this, Romans 11, verse 33, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Just in case every, any one of you here ever read the book of Romans and you are like, I've figured God out 100%. No. Verse 11, he says, Yani, God, we can't even get to the depths of his getting to know him. He's a bottomless sea. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, he would say, for now, we only see a poor reflection as in a mirror. In those days, the mirrors used to have poor reflection. Thank God for modern technology. Woo mirrors of those days used to be made up of polished bronze. These days, at least, our mirrors are made up of aluminum, a very reflective material, or silver, you know, and glass. Awesome. But in those days, you couldn't see very well. So it's like, for now, we only know things and clearly as in a mirror. He says, we know things in part, but then we'll know things fully, even as we are fully known. You know that verse? He was content. He was like, he was willing to admit, we only know things partially. But I will tell you, friends, cult leaders know everything. They promise you or they purport that they know a lot of stuff. They've got no limits. Like, for example, we all struggle with prayer, right? In fact, the scriptures say, we do not know how to pray. <laughs> you don't know how to pray. That's why the Holy Spirit is interceding for you with wordless groans. But there will come a man who will say, hey, I know why your prayers are not being answered. 
They know everything. Yeah? We don't know why some people suffer as they do. Okay, there are some people who we know why they are suffering. Okay, we just need to tell you, you stop doing this and then. But not everyone. We don't know why some people go through what they go through. And God has kept that information hidden from us. We do not know why some people die, for example, and others remain alive. You've just heard from the assistant bishop that this week has been a very heavy week for our people. And we had the opportunity of showing up when the wound was still raw. And I will tell you, we did not know what to say. I mean, what do you say? Why this? Why this one? Why now? And we, like Job, just remain quiet. But some man of God somewhere will tell you it has got something to do with your star that is not very well aligned. Nyotayako. What? They know stuff. Okay? Or it's something to do with your, you know, you are cast. Nimeona komacho yangu ya imani. With my eyes of faith, you know, they have a word of knowledge. They know, they know something. And they want you to see them kando with an envelope so that they can explain it to you. Things that are, they are kept hidden. God has not revealed some of these things to us. And friends, you must be content to knowing that we will never know everything in this world. Why must you know everything? Ask yourself that question. So how many people are taking advantage? You open yourself up for abuse because you want to. You must know everything. Understand that some things are kept hidden from us and only God knows. That's why Manoah was told, my name this is beyond understanding. My name is beyond understanding. It is way past your pay grade, Manoah. Well, you can't understand. It reminds me of a hymn, which I like. And the hymn writer, he talks about some of the, in fact, all the verses he talks about what he does not know. And in the chorus, he celebrates what he knows. Okay, I don't know whether you know this hymn. I've been singing it, trying to learn it at home. It goes something like this. <clears throat> let, me, let me try to sing. Okay. First half, his guys didn't walk away, so. It goes like this. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known. Nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the dead. I know not how the saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. Amen. Please go look for that hymn. I haven't even sung uh, <clears throat> verse uh, 3 and 4 because I know the worship team probably would have not come for the third service. Be like, that guy can sing. <laughs> let, <laughs> let him just... Yes, there's a lot that we don't know. But I tell you, friends, what we know is enough. Especially what concerns Christ. It's very interesting because I know some of your translations, the response that the angel of the Lord gave Manoah when he said, 
My name is beyond understanding. Some of your translations say, my name is wonderful. Anyone whose name says, my name is wonderful? Anyone whose Bible says that? Okay. My name is wonderful. And commentators say, Hebrew word used there is closely related with the Hebrew word that Isaiah used in Isaiah chapter 9 when he was talking about the coming Messiah. So the coming Messiah will be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Wonderful Counselor, wonderful. The same word. It's beyond understanding that range of meaning that it has. And I want to say to you, friends, to know Christ is to know God. To know Christ is to know God. You, you can even confidently say, I actually know his name, right? Let that satisfy your curiosity. You know whom you have believed, and you are persuaded that he is able to keep that which you have committed unto him and against that day. Amen? Here's my last point, and let me say it very quickly. Think. Think. That's, that's the last point. Okay? And we find it in verse 22. Okay? After the angel of the Lord had ascended in the flames, and Manoah and his wife just realized who this was. He says in verse 22, Manoah said, we are doomed to die. He said to his wife, we have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. Right? In summary, Manoah shouted, we are going to die. His wife said, oh, let's take care of I mean, verse 22 and 23, it shows you either who was the more reasonable one in that marriage or who was the one who was spiritually mature, or both. Right? I mean, one of the things I like about Manoah's wife is that she knew that our faith is a reasonable faith. And she was not afraid to use her mind and to reason logically because faith and reason are not enemies. I mean, not to throw shade on Manoah or to judge him. Actually, I know Manoah when he was saying, we are going to die. He was just being reverent. This is reverence, okay? Because if he has God, and that's, you know what? Actually, reverence is better than irreverence. I know that many of us, our struggle is not reverence. Our struggle, we, ours, we struggle with irreverence. Have you ever met a guy who tells you, you know, me and, me and a God, me and my boys. I'm like, you and God are what? My boys. Me, I think we struggle with irreverence. So this is not bad. However, reverence combined with reason is even better. Right? And this is where Manoah's wife comes shining. Because when Manoah is jumping into error, Manoah's wife, she has three reasons why she's not afraid. Okay? If God wanted to kill us, number one, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hearts. Uh -huh. Number two, nor shown us all these things. We know God has shown us a lot of things lately. And number three, he would not have told us this. Probably she meant, you know, that we are going to have a child, and then he kills us. Manoah, does that make sense? <laughs> Who's going to have this child then? <laughs> you know, she was just a thinker. That's what I love about her, Right? I mean, of course, we know that there was this Bible verse in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, that says, no one may see me and live. But you know, you have to take the full counsel of Scripture here into view. Don't fall into the habit of taking one Bible verse and then formulating a whole theology around one Bible verse. That's what cults do. It's called segmented biblical attention. So on some cults, out there, the Mormons, for example, they baptize their dead people. You know, they just take an obscure verse from the book of Corinthians, you know, and then they now come up with a whole theology around it. Thankfully, Mrs. Manoah, she was a thinking Christian. And she reminds us that God did not give us a mind and then intends us to forego its use when we are worshipping him. In fact, 
The Bible says about loving the Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, underline that, and with all of your strength. So whenever you're coming to church, don't leave your mind at home. Okay? Here we have come to engage and to reason together. And I find it to be very interesting because cults will never encourage people to think. They prefer emotionalism, euphoria, and stuff like that. In fact, somebody reminded me after the first service, did you notice that in this cult, the cult leader was actually against education? Remember that? Really making people come out of school. Because you can manipulate people better when they are not able to think. Friends, our faith is not against reason. In fact, I want to end it like this. What Blaise Pascal said, he was a French mathematician. He said this, that our faith is not against reason. But our faith goes beyond reason. Not against it, but beyond it. I want us to remember that. And so to summarize, here are the four points again. There is nothing new to add. God has already given us his, his word. And here's the second one. The God, of, the God of the man is more important than the man of God. And here's the third one. There is a limit to our understanding. And then lastly, please do what? Think. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we want to thank you for this word that is God-breathed and it is profitable even in this day for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness. Thank you for this word that is alive and active. Never grows old. It still speaks today. Thank you that you have reminded us this is all we need. Thank you, Lord, for the faithful ministers of the gospel around the world who correctly divide the word of truth, who feed the sheep your word. And how I pray, Lord, for this congregation, that there will be those who remain faithful and who remain steadfast in the truth, that they will not be led astray by these wolves in sheep clothing. Teach us, Lord, how to correctly divide the word of truth and how to watch our life and our doctrines closely. I pray, Lord, that you would change any inclination in us that tends to elevate men, tends to idolatry and worshiping of people. May you help us instead, Lord, to honor you, to put our hope and our trust in you and not in men who can fail. How I pray, my God, that you would help us to know our limits so that we will not be led into error and we will not be deceived. Teach us how to think. Teach us how to treasure your word. Lord, I pray that you would keep us in the obedience of faith. That you would guard us from error. We want to pray for the many families that are grieving and mourning because of the loss of their loved ones or because of their loved ones who were abused and deceived. May you comfort those families. May you comfort us as a country. May you look upon us with mercy, O oh God, for the things that have been done here in this nation in your name. And we pray that you would continue to help us to know what, are the, what is the right way to follow you. So we give you all the glory and all the honor. Lord, teach us these things.